hear me? I guess you, I hope you can. Uh, this is uh, Gitte Persson and on uh, behalf of uh, Asa Khalil from Aarhus and Jimmy Sønderkorp from Aalborg University Hospitals, I'd like to welcome you to the DCCC Radiotherapy webinar on stereotactic ablative radiotherapy for oligometastatic disease. And I'd like you all to note that the webinar being uh, recorded and all the presenters have a accepted this, but if you do not wish to uh, have your image uh, recorded, then please just turn off uh, your camera. Okay, then. Okay. Haha. <laughs> so, why are we talking about this? Uh, with what is this oligometastatic disease? We've talked about it in a long time, before a long, a long time ago, and then it kind of became uh, old school, but now it's coming back. And why is this? Um, maybe we're in the middle of a paradigm shift and uh, we're going from a binary defined uh, definition of cancer as either you have a local disease or you have metastatic disease. So it's kind of you can be just a little bit pregnant, so you can have just a little bit a metastatic disease. That was the way we looked at it before, but now maybe we will look at it as the spectrum of disease. Also, we have this fantastic improvement in systemic treatment that really facilitates a new role for the local therapy in these patients with the patients with metastatic disease. And then also we have been for a long time uh, been aware that cure is not the only valuable endpoint that we're really able to uh, control uh, disease for a very long time and also uh, prolong overall survival uh, in patients with uh, both radiotherapy and systemic treatment. Okay, this is a very sensitive mouse. Okay. So I just I just went through the internet today and on how how do we define oligometastatic disease? Many papers have been written about this uh, subject, but I saw I saw a discussion on YouTube where David Palmer really said I I, I don't think that we're ever going to be able to define oligometastatic disease. And David Palmer, he's the one who who did the uh, he, who's done a lot of uh, SPRT trials on um, oligometastatic disease. I guess I hope Meta will come back to that in her presentation. And then um, uh, Jack West, he cited uh, the famous Weisselbaum uh, to have answered to the question how to define oligometastatic disease. He was supposed to have said, I don't know. And Jack West, West said, kind of a famous person, uh, oncologist on social media, uh, commented our very nice astro, uh, astro uh, consensus guideline and said it was that it was a defini definition based on what is used in clinical trial. trial and he uh, thought it was a very empiric non-answer to the question. So uh, when uh, in 2018, when we were uh, all uh, trying to uh, meet up to uh, within the, the DCCC radiotherapy to, to discuss which groups to form, uh, one of the groups we formed was the IP15 uh, uh, on oligometastatic disease. And, and it was Esa Khalil, who's a co host here, a co moderator, uh, and I who, who hosted this. Uh, this IP, this, this work group. And our aim was to provide an option for a stereotactic body radiotherapy of all metastatic sites, uh, most, uh, mostly by uh, trying to uh, make way for phase two trials that were uh, lesion uh, directed. But also, we wanted to do a national uh, organ metastatic disease uh, phase two uh, study, more like a register across all cancer diagnosis, uh, including um, uh, trans, uh, translational research and also including all organ metastatic states. Uh, and this is just a, a scheme of some of the activities we've been uh, we've had in the IP15. But 
why we wanted this to have this safe deliver, delivery of SPG tool and aesthetic sites is that it, it's, it's, that's not how it is. And this is just like a, a scheme to say that we have some locations, metastatic locations, where we feel very uh, uh, secure, secure to deliver uh, high doses of radiation therapy. We know this from trials and experience. And that's, for example, for the peripheral lung tumors, for a few, for a few small brain lesions, uh, for bony metastasis in in not weight bearing uh, bones, and also for uh, um, liver metastases that are not very central and not very close to uh, hollow organs in the abdomen. And then, if we move away from this, it gets more and more. Um, unknown or with the, how safe it is to deliver this radiotherapy. And that's why we wanted all these phase two trials. So today we're gonna hear from three experts in the area. First, uh, Meta Fetta, who's doing a PhD on the um, of his hospital, uh, but, uh, uh, and is um, doing a phase two trials, but uh, col collaborates with the many centers across Denmark and Norway uh, on the inclusion of patients. You'll tell us about bone and soft tissue metastasis. Then uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to hear uh, Karin Lindberg, uh, who's uh, joining us from Karolinska Hospital in, uh, in Stockholm, who's gonna uh, tell us about the very much discussed HILUS trial on central and ultra, ultra central lung tumors. And if you just, Go back to the to the last slide that was in the red area. So that's going to be really exciting to hear about. And then uh, Søren Müller is going to tell us a lot about uh, the treatment uh, of brain metastasis, uh, stereotactic radio surgery for brain metastasis, uh, and the long experience they've uh, had uh, with this treatment on this was particular. And then if we have time, uh, we'll, I'd like to discuss with you uh, how to move forward uh, on the national uh, oligo project. So just a little bit housekeeping. Uh, please save your questions to after each presentation. Uh, just type your questions in the chat box. Uh, Esa Khalil will, uh, will uh, keep an eye on that and uh, help asking the questions. And um, maybe if we could get uh, Jimmy to keep an eye on the time and just, uh, just uh, that'd be great. So with this, I'd really like to uh, welcome first Mede, Mede Felder. Um, and uh, you're gonna tell us a lot about your very recent experience with both uh, soft tissue, uh, treating uh, soft tissue metastasis and bone metastasis. Thank you. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Gide, for this nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah. So my name is Mette Felder, yes, and uh, I'm a PhD student at Herlev Hospital. And my uh, principal supervisor is Gitte Pearson. And uh, together with the other centers, we have uh, uh, started out uh, two protocols for uh, oligo uh, metastatic disease, uh, patients with oligo metastatic disease. One of the protocols uh, called SOFT uh, for soft tissue metastasis under the diaphragm, uh, mr linux specific treatment. And uh, the other one uh, is uh, for bone metastasis called bony m And uh, this latter one, we just closed a month ago because we reached our aim with uh, 67 patients included. So uh, just to start out uh, with uh, making sure everyone is familiar with the term uh, uh, SBRT. Uh, SBRT is stereotactic body radiotherapy, also called SABER, and it's high precision uh, radiotherapy. Uh, if you see uh, the pictures uh, at this slide, to the left we have uh, uh, SBRT treatment technique with uh, small targets, uh, inhomogeneous dose delivery to the target and steep uh, dose gradient. Uh, to the right, uh, to compare, this is a conventional radiotherapy uh, uh, technique uh, with uh, often uh, larger margins and uh, slower dose uh, 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 fall off curves. So this is not a new technique. It's been known, uh, been used for, for many uh, uh, decades. Um, we have in uh, we started out in uh, CNS uh, tumors, uh, 
uh, where uh, they introduced this technique, later on implemented it to uh, lung tumors. And uh, from there on, we have uh, now included several uh, other sites where uh, we use uh, SBRT uh, mostly in clinical trials. So this slides only to, uh, uh, so we remember that uh, uh, this is not the only ablative technique. Uh, we have uh, several um, tools in this toolbox. Uh, to the left, we have the thermal uh, ablative technique, uh, the uh, surgeons uh, of use or the uh, intervention radiologists with RFA and microwave ablation, most often used for liver metastasis. And um, here classified as non-thermal ablation, we have the SBRT. So also to get familiar with the term oligometastatic disease, like uh, Gita also uh, uh, mentioned. So we have to the left localized disease, where the goal of uh, most often is to cure the patient. And uh, to uh, the right, we have uh, white, a patient with widespread uh, metastatic disease, uh, most often uh, treated with a systemic uh, therapy. And somewhere in between, we have uh, uh, a patient with oligometastatic disease. Uh, it's a patient with uh, most often defined with a few metastases and a few uh, organs. So the strategy has been used for a really long time. And this was uh, one of the first case reports uh, from 1938, um, reporting a middle-aged woman uh, treated for a renal cell cancer. She had a uh, metastasis to the lung and they reported a five-year uh, survivor uh, for this patient. She was living in good health without any evidence of uh, disease. So the strategy has been used for quite a long time. And um, uh, and you you mentioned, uh, Gita, that Weiselbaum uh, didn't exactly know how to define uh, this state, but uh, he tried to uh, do that uh, together with his colleague Hellman in 1995. And these uh, two gentlemen were the first one to uh, de uh, define the oligometastatic state as a solid tumor metastasis uh, that uh, may remain confined to a limited number of organs. So this is a new publication from Guggenberger uh, uh, and his colleagues who have tried to characterize and classify uh, patients with oligometastatic disease. And they have, um, they have come up with a, a decision uh, tree, a decision map, resulting in nine different uh, OMD states. And uh, this is a help tool to try to uh, look into uh, the prognosis and the treatment goals for uh, the individual patient. It says something about the different cancer, uh, cancers development uh, over time. So there are some randomized phase two trials uh, which have tested uh, an OMD uh, strategy uh, and um, together with SBRT or other local abrasive uh, techniques. So most often uh, patients uh, with lung, colorectal, breast or prostate cancer have been tested uh, in clinical trials and most often uh, with metastasis up to five. Uh, so the clinical outcome examined uh, have been uh, progression free survival and overall survival. And in these phase two trials, we have seen a signal of a, 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 a benefit of this, this treatment uh, strategy. So this is just to show you that uh, we don't have any uh, results of any uh, phase three trials yet, but there are many uh, on the way, uh, many uh, actively recruiting. And here is uh, some of, uh, of uh, the, the studies uh, uh, actively recruiting. So one of the most famous and most cited uh, study, uh, phase two study was the Sabre Comet. 
Uh, this was a protocol including uh, all kinds of different solid uh, tumors uh, with patients having a maximum of five metastases. And they randomized 99 patients between a control group uh, uh, where they got the systemic therapy and best supportive care. Um, and 66 patients uh, where they added the uh, SBRT treatment. And um, most uh, often we again saw that uh, that's, uh, the four uh, large uh, primary tumor groups, breast, colorectal, lung, and prostate were included uh, in this protocol. Of note, um, you can see that most of the patients had up to three metastases, very few four and five metastases. And also I think it's worth noting that half of the patients was actually treated for uh, lung metastasis uh, and one third of bone metastasis. This is to emphasize that uh, the knowledge we have of uh, soft tissue metastasis uh, is scarce. Um, for example, here you see adrenal glands were only constituting 3% uh, of the, the tumors uh, treated and liver only 5%. So there was an overall survival benefit in the um, intervention arm uh, showed here uh, in this uh, figure. And um, unfortunately, uh, they also had to report a quite high rate of uh, grade three, uh, grade five toxicity in the treatment group. So one patient died of radiation pneumonitis, one patient died of a a pulmonary abscess, and uh, the third patient died after surgery for a perforated gastric uh, ulcer. So this um, this was uh, a little surprising to uh, the authors uh, that it was uh, so high, but keep in mind that it's still few patients. They have uh, included 99 patients. So in 2020, uh, Palmer and his colleague came up with the long-term result of the Sabre Comet, and they didn't see any new uh, toxicity uh, to report, but uh, they also showed this Kaplan-Meier plot uh, for the development of new metastases, and they stated that, uh, uh, that at some point, uh, most patients progress over time. And I think this is uh, important also when you talk to patients, if they are to be included in these protocols, that um, uh, for most patients, a cure is not possible. But just as Gita mentioned in the beginning here, maybe cure is not the only uh, goal for the patients. So as we have no phase three trials, we are uh, gathering, uh, collecting data prospectively, but also here we have a, a meta-analysis for the SBRT outcome uh, outside the CNS, uh, a new publication. And uh, here they have gathered uh, 21 studies, prospective studies, uh, just uh, around uh, 1,000 patients uh, with less or equal to five sites uh, of, of treatment sites. And they report uh, uh, rates of grade three to five toxicity, about 3%, and a one-year local recurrence rate for about uh, 95%. And this is, uh, this is quite similar to uh, many of the retrospective um, trials we have seen. Uh, most trials report local control rate, rate at one year um, above uh, 90% and uh, uh, very seldom grade five toxicity. So this is uh, some of the new uh, publications on the toxicity in, uh, in these trials. And uh, like the Sabre Comet, they reported uh, grade five uh, toxicity 4.5%. But uh, uh, grade uh, three and four toxicity uh, about five, six uh, percent. There are one uh, trial here, the BR001, uh, reporting 20 percent toxicity, uh, constituting 42 patients. And just to look a little further into that, 
uh, here they have uh, have shown a table uh, over the the toxicity uh, reported. And if you look uh, to the right, you can see how many days from uh, the SBRT start they reported the 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 uh, incidences, and uh, quite often it's uh, after half a year. Uh, and sometimes also after a year. And you also see that most of the patients have been patients uh, with uh, toxicity uh, pneumonitis, for example, or, or a fracture of the bones. And these are, these are uh, uh, adverse events we know to, to be reported in these protocols. So uh, SBRT have been used in uh, many atomical uh, uh, locations, and uh, here in the next uh, half a part of my uh, session, I would uh, focus on liver metastasis, adrenal metastasis, and bone metastasis. So to start out with adrenal uh, metastasis, uh, these are uh, infrequent uh, of the pooled patients you see referred to as BRT. You could see that in uh, Saber Comet, uh, they reported 3% and this match very well other, other protocols and registry trials. Um, most of the patients with adrenal glands is uh, patients with uh, lung cancer. Um, and uh, when you look at stage four lung cancer, about 8% of the patients have a solitary lesions, lesion in the adrenal gland. So here also is shown a, a pooled meta-analysis uh, uh, rev and review of 39 studies with over a thousand patients treated for uh, adrenal tumors. Uh, these data are collected between 2009 and 19, and you see they have reported a two-year local control rate of 63% and a two-year overall survival rate at uh, 42%. If they looked at the subgroup uh, of patients who had uh, received a BED above 100 gray, uh, it improved the local control, two-year local control rate. Um, and ended up in 86% of patients. And the grade three toxicity reported uh, was low 2%. Here was another uh, study looking at exactly the same. Uh, they were looking at adrenal gland metastasis and the, the, the uh, risk of local failure after SBRT and they divided the patients into two group, groups, the patients getting uh, above 100 gray BED and below 100 gray BED. And you can all see there are, there are significant differences. There was a 100% local control rate for the patients receiving over 100 gray. So getting uh, moving on to SBRT for liver metastasis, so uh, this is one of the new high-tech uh, reports. Um, they looked at the, uh, the rate of local control after uh, SBRT, but they looked further into uh, whether the studies had reported uh, the uh, radiotherapy uh, details. And only six studies uh, could, uh, could comply with that. So, they looked at 219 patients. Uh, half of them was patients with colorectal cancer. Keep in mind that the other half was uh, from other primary sites. And also they could uh, see a difference between local control rate and the dose delivered. Uh, if you had a BAD above 100 gray, you had a better, much better uh, lo local control rate. And this difference uh, became more significant uh, over the years. So why don't we just treat all patients with a, a high BED? This is of course because sometimes uh, the target is located in an inconvenient uh, location. So for example, this patient was a patient with colorectal cancer and the two uh, liver metastases not uh, eligible for surgery and uh, 
we treated him in the soft protocol and, and this uh, GTV you see is very close to the stomach. So we can't do miracles. So uh, what we uh, do in the soft protocol is we keep uh, 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 the constraints to the risk organs of risk and then uh, compromise the target dose. And this is also an example of uh, where we, we had to do this. So we try to use different uh, techniques to uh, improve our, our target delivery, to improve how uh, high dose we can get into the tumors. Also, of course, to spare the, the organs at risk. And I just want to show you. So the soft uh, protocol was MR-Linux specific, and this is one of the patients included there uh, who had two liver metastases. And uh, as you see, this is uh, a sin of uh, during the, the preparation of the treatment where we tested whether he could cope with the breath hold. So the red line is a target area and the yellow line is a, a boundary. And the red line has to be inside the yellow line before we trust that uh, we can deliver it the, the dose. Yeah. Not only the dose uh, uh, delivered to the target matters, it's also uh, the size matters of the targets. This is a, a new publication uh, where they have looked into um, uh, the risk of local failure for patients with colorectal cancer and liver metastasis treated uh, with SBRT. And uh, they reported that uh, they could um, if uh, the tumor was uh, below 30 cubic centimeters, there was a better uh, uh, local control rate. So this is also uh, important. So this is uh, the last uh, anatomical location I will discuss, SBRT for bone metastasis. So the use of SBRT to bone metastasis has been uh, documented as safe and efficacy efficacious with one year local control rate of uh, more than 80%. Uh, we have seen low toxicity rates if we comply with the constraints. Um, and uh, also now more data uh, are coming in with the durable response in long-term survivors. So why use bone SBRT instead of conventional uh, radiotherapy? Well, first, we want to achieve better local control, and uh, we have data that that can be achieved uh, with SBRT. We also want some time to shorten the treatment time if we are um, if we want to start a systemic therapy alongside. Um, there are also data that uh, this uh, using SBRT improve the complete pain response compared to conventional radiotherapy. And like we have uh, seen in my slides here, there are phase two data um, uh, documenting improved overall survival for selected uh, patients group. Uh, there are also uh, a last uh, point that I think is necessary to stress is, uh, so it can be worthwhile also to decrease the risk of uh, re-irradiation. So this was a phase two, three trial, a randomized trial, uh, documenting a higher rate of complete pain response uh, when using SBRT compared to conventional radiotherapy. And um, yes, you can look further into that if you're interested. So for the moment, uh, ASTRO recommendations uh, from 2017, uh, report that SBRT in bone metastasis should be limited to clinical trials. The NCCN guidelines, uh, updated guidelines uh, conclude that SBRT may be preferred in three circumstances where we want to re-radiate if we have a patient with uh, oligometastatic disease and if, uh, or if a patient has a radio resistant tumor. 
So I think many centers are starting out with a, a, a bone uh, SBRT program and are new in the field. And um, uh, luckily for all of us, uh, there have been experts using this treatment regime for, for a long time, and they have come up with guidelines to help us contour. Uh, for example, this is uh, Cox delineation guidelines uh, recommending how to contour the CTV in spine patients. And uh, just uh, last year, a new publication came about uh, on recommendation for, uh, for, for uh, metastasis in the sacral area. But still, our main concern and uh, challenge is, of course, the delineation of the GTV. And uh, this is, there are definitely room for improvement. This is a case we uh, sent it out uh, for all the centers recruiting in Bone M. We had a case and we uh, delineated and they came together and at an investigator meeting discussing it. So we saw quite a lot of differences in the way we delineated. This is no surprise. We have seen this in other anatomical locations as well. For example, here in head and neck, they have also challenges. So one of the main uh, challenge when treating spine as, uh, SBRT is of course the medulla and constraints to the medulla. And uh, this will uh, compromise the target uh, depending on the, the dose you accept to the medulla. And uh, in bone M, we, uh, we, uh, we had this uh, constraint. You see uh, the table below here. And we had the same constraint for the spinal cord as the spinal cord PRV. The high tech. Uh, uh, group has also uh, written a recommendation, uh, uh, a report on this uh, in this area, but they are not given any conclusive recommendation. And I think it's because there are aren't in, not enough data uh, to do be hundred percent sure what is the tolerance dose of the medulla. For example, in the middle you see Sagal's recommendation. Uh, he's one of the um, people who have uh, written most about uh, patients uh, having an adverse uh, event with the radio-induced myelitis. And he is quite conservative in his way of uh, uh, setting a constraint compared to a PM. Uh, but this also depends on how you delineate medulla. And this is an area uh, to study uh, 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 with a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, interesting uh, considerations. So this uh, is excuse me, uh, Mette, I just have to remind you that you are running out of time in this. Uh, yes, yes. So maybe I will skip this and just say that there are data also, emerging data uh, uh, showing benefit uh, when using SBRT to non-bone, uh, non-spine metastasis. There are a little bit more scare than uh, for spine, but uh, more people are recruiting. Uh, so timing is important. And uh, this was my last yeah, slide. Thank you very much, Meta, for a very clear uh, discussion. There is, uh, I think we will take uh, just a couple of questions because of the time. Uh, one of the questions that came from Sandy from uh, Aarhus is, is there a size limit for bone or liver metastasis? Uh, so in the protocols we have uh, been running, we have a size limit for five centimeters, and that's what most protocols use. But uh, there are uh, 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 documents uh, for uh, uh, larger size, especially in liver metastasis. Uh, the problem is that the high dose area, sometimes when you have a large target, becomes uh, 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 quite uh, important uh, in large targets. Substantial. You, the, yeah, the second question is one that we uh, consider a lot, whether that um, uh, it's a comment about that the phase two uh, Saber Comet trial was um, including a lot of uh, different pathology and different types of tumors, uh, some of them was favorable 
prognosis. This is a question uh, or a comment from, from Jörn Johansson. And we have to take care not to draw conclusion uh, from uh, trials making uh, good benefit for favorable diseases like prostate and breast mm -hmm. and make it for colorectum cancer. That yeah, so they actually did a sub analysis because they could see that in the intervention group there was quite a lot of uh, prostate patients. So they did a subgroup analysis and could see that uh, the, the difference, the beneficial effect was still seen, even though they took out all the prostate pa cancer patients. But I, I, I really agree that this is a very in, uh, homogeneous group and we have to take care not to draw any wrong conclusions. So thank you very much, Meta. I think we uh, should move on. But uh, to our all our participants, you remember to consider patients for clinical trials. So, Mede, if you stop sharing your screen and maybe Karin uh, Lindberg, are you? Yes, you're here. I'd like you to welcome Karin Lindberg, who's a, uh, is a, is a medical doctor, PhD from Karolinska uh, um, Hospital in, in Stockholm. And she has a lot of experience with the stereotactic radiotherapy and was um, uh, has been uh, presenting and writing up the, the HILUS trial. So um, please, Karin, and thanks a lot for participating. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and letting me speak. Uh, I will put on my full screen right now, so I won't be able to see or anything. So if, if you have any problems, you have to shout at me, basically, because I will only see my slides. Uh, so, and I hope you see my slides right now. Uh, so my name is Karen Lindberg. I'm a clinical oncologist at the Karolinska. I treat mainly lung cancer patients, both with medical therapy as well as uh, radiation therapy. And I will give you a brief overview. Karen, of... we're seeing your whole um, PowerPoint presentation. Could, could you, you put are... in a presentation mode? Uh, I think I have, but apparently not. Um, mm. uh... Maybe just stop sharing and try again and then... then yeah, we'll try again. Another screen, yeah. So is that better? Yes, yes, yeah. much better. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, my intention was to give you an overview of the uh, of what's known about this biology of centrally located lung lesions, as well as to go through the results from the HILUS trial that was a trial conducted in the Nordic countries. Uh, so this is interesting. Could you see me? <laughs> Sorry, I can't really move anything here right now. Nope. Maybe you have to just uh, uh, look at the entire presentation because I can't really change the picture. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, we'll try again. Nope. That's fine, Karen. Okay, so whatever you, works for you, that's fine. So well, good for you. You will have to see my notes as well then. <laughs> uh, so I'll make it. Um, let's see if I can just make it as big as possible. Um, uh, like this. So could you bear with this one instead? Anyway, is it okay? It's fine. Maybe yeah. you can just sting. Uh, yeah, I know. I, there we have it. Yes. So, That's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, this is really interesting. It worked in the morning because um, uh, maybe we should just give it a, one more try. Could you look? Do you see my entire presentation right now? This or is fine the, now. It's fine now. Okay, perfect. So you see the centrally located tumor is a clinical issue? Yeah, good. So, sorry about this. So the question is really, if you look on your right hand side, you can see I don't this. think we see the right thing. I think we still see your uh, wrong screen in a way. Are you working on two screens? No, I only have uh, one screen. It normally weird. works. That's weird. Uh, 
it's um, yeah, it's weird because it normally works. When so, you're sharing, are you sharing the screen or the desktop or the uh, document? The screen. I'm sharing the screen. The desktop. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we're still seeing your PowerPoint. Um, so it's... if you have animations and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what's wrong, really. Do you still see it? No, it looks better. OK. It yes. looks good. Yeah, yes. the problem is that I can't do anything then. That's my problem. Ah. I, OK, yeah, I can ah. do anything. Perfect. It's so, working. But I can't uh, move back. So you will just have to imagine the the, the picture on the right hand side. Uh, so actually, there we can see a, a tumor actually threatening the bronchus. And the problem is that for these patients, there's really not a good treatment option because surgery is complicated. If you treat with SBRT, we know from very early experiences that you will have excessive toxicity if we treat with the same high doses as we use for the peripherally located lung lesions. And if you try to treat them with conventionally fractionated radiotherapy, it's also difficult to get the doses high enough. So from this first publication, uh, you could actually create a no-fly zone, which is a zone around two centimeters around the proximal bronchial tree, which is defined as the carina, the main bronchi, the intermediate bronchus, and the lobi bronchi. And this was a no-fly zone where you could see that you had increased toxicity if you treated them with a three fractionation schedule. But in the absence of other treatment options, experienced centers did continue with this treatment anyway, and they used risk-adapted fractionation schedules. So during 2010 and 2012, uh, there were a number of uh, clinical reports showing that you could treat these tumors with a good local control if you use the risk-adapted fractionation schedule with a protracted uh, schedule, and you would have an increased but yet acceptable toxicity. There also came a review in 2013 of more than 500 tumors that showed that if you treated them with a BED of more than 100 gray, BD10, you would have a high local control of more than 85% and with a limited toxicity with a grade 5 toxicity probability of less than 3%. Um, and these were actually during these years when we designed the HILAS trial and started to include patients in 2011. It was not until 2015-16 when these, uh, I would say, um, definition of ultra-centrally located tumors actually came to be a subject that centrally located tumors would actually contain both moderately central as well as ultra-centrally located tumors. And then in the end of 2019, there was a publication of the RTOG 0813 trial, which had included patients with centrally located tumors, not only ultra-centrally though, and also, earlier this year, we had the publication from our, our own HILAS trial. And ongoing right now, we have the SUNSET trial, which is a trial specifically for ultra-centrally located tumors, where they try to actually establish which doses you can deliver to these centrally located structures. And we also have the Canadian LUSTER trial, where they treat both centrally located tumors as well as peripherally located tumors and compare them to a conventionally fractionated radiotherapy regimen. So this is a, a bit more of this overview where you can see that you have a number of reports up until 2015, which is actually saying that you can treat these patients in a safe way. And then in 2015, 16, there are reports about this ultra-centrally ultra located tumors, which are at risk for high-grade toxic effects. And if you look at these studies uh, a bit more thoroughly, uh, the first one, 2016, is a retrospective analysis of more than 100 uh, tumors, which 18 were abutting the bronchi and termed ultra-centrally located. They were treated with 9 to 10 grade times 5, and they could see that four of these patients, which would be 22% of the ultra-centrally located, actually had grade 5 toxicity, and two with uh, hemoptysis and two with pneumonia, with or without respiratory failure. Uh, another publication came from the Free University in 2016. They had looked at 47 patients, which had been treated with 5 grade times 12, which would then be even more gentle. They had a slightly different definition of the ultracentral location with the PTV overlapping the trachea or the main stem bronchi. But they could also see that they had 21% of the patients having a possibly treatment-related death, 
and the grade 5 hemoptysis for 15% of the patients. So these were two publications that actually pointed out that this could be dangerous to do this. Then there came two other publications also treating ultracentrally located lung tumors. This was a rather small publication of just 20 patients. As you can see, they treated with 35 to 40 gray in five fractions. So they were these doses were not too high. Uh, they did not actually experience any grade 5 toxicity, but on the other hand, if you look at the local control rate, that was quite poor. So possibly uh, these tumors were not treated aggressively enough. There's also another publication from Chadhuri from 2015. It's also a retrospective analysis with seven patients abutting uh, the bronchus. But if you look here, you did not have any serious toxicity either, but only one patient had a tumor abutting the main bronchus, which we think would be at high risk for clinically evident toxicity. So there's also been a few reviews, and this is one from 2019, where they actually pooled almost 300 tumors, both central and ultracentrally located. As you can see in between these studies, there was a great difference be between the grade three to five toxicity, up to 56 of the patients suffering grade three to five toxicity. And if you look at treatment related death, it was up to 22% of the toxicity. And they discovered a trend for more complications in ultracentrally located tumors. And as you can see here in the table, uh, they had a two-year local control rate, which is high. Uh, there is uh, the two-year overall survival is, I would say, poor. And this is a drawback when you should interpret the toxicity. And if you see here at the complication grade three and above, it's an average uh, 23%. So this is, this is an overview, mainly to just point out that during the last three years, there have been a number of publications on centrally located tumors and especially ultra-centrally located tumors, where you can see that they have experienced high-grade toxic effect as well. And you can see that pneumonia, hemoptysis, and radiation pneumonitis are quite uh, commonly reported high-grade toxic effects. There have been a few publications that have tried to look at, to model this toxicity. And if you see, there are three publications modeling radiological toxicity, and they have modeled toxicity radiologically, either as stenosis, bronchial occlusion, with or without atelectasis, or only atelectasis. And what you can see here from this radiological toxicity, uh, you can actually see that these small bronchi sort of the, the lobar bronchus, segmental bronchi, they seem to be more susceptible to this radiological damage. When you look at modeling clinical toxicity, I would say this is complicated because if you model grade five clinical toxicity, you will have a variety of symptoms. Everything from pneumonia, radiation pneumonitis, hemoptysis, or even euthanasia due to respiratory failure. So I would say this is, this is difficult to, to actually compare these studies and to model this type of toxicity. Uh, we will go through an attempt to model grade five bleeding that we did within the HILAS trial. So now I was thinking of going through the HILAS trial, what we did and the results of the HILAS trial. Uh, <clears throat> this was done in cooperation of the framework of the Nordic SBRT study group, which is a great cooperation between Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, we have regular meetings, as you probably know, one to twice, two times a year, as well as the cooperation both with prospective and retrospective clinical trials as well. So uh, this was a phase two study. It was multi-center, so we included patients from nine different centers in the Nordics. They were all treated with seven grade times eight, and this was a non-randomized study. We included primary non-small cell lung cancer, as well as metastases from any other uh, solid tumor. The primary endpoint was local control at six, 12, and 24 months, and secondary endpoints included toxicity, as well as overall survival. We, we were not sure how easy it would be to find these tumors or patients so we aimed in the protocol to include 60 patients uh, altogether. We had a bit of a different central definition. The classical definition, as I mentioned before, was a two centimeter zone around the proximal bronchial tree. 
we tightened this up to be a one centimeter zone inside, instead. And the reason behind is that if you imagine that you have a tumor actually uh, being out here and touching from outside, if you have a two centimeter zone, this will be a quite a peripherally located lung tumor. So this was actually to, uh, to capture the centrally located lung tumors. What we thought was that it might be a different toxicity profile for the tumors residing in group A uh, in comparison to group B. So we stratified them into the, these two groups, where group A was defined as a tumor residing or touching from outside one centimeter of a main bronchus, and the group B was a tumor residing or touching from outside within one centimeter of a lower bronchus, but more than one centimeter away from a main bronchus. So in brief, the inclusion criteria was that we had primary non-small cell lung cancer verified either with histology or cytology or post CT and uh, repeated CT scans or a metastasis, which was locally progressive. Uh, it was maximum five centimeter in diameter. And we had this definition of central location. Uh, the tumor should be locally progressive. So we should know that we could actually evaluate uh, local control in a good way. And the patients were supposed to be in performance status zero to two and have a life expectancy of at least three months. The inclusion criteria consisted, <clears throat> among others, but the most important ones were that we did not want to have a tumor reaching through the wall of a main bronchus. We did not allow for any other concomitant systemic anti-cancer therapy. And we had the definition of an adequate lung function to tolerate the treatment. And this was based on that uh, if you have a central tumor that is very close to a main bronchus, an injury causing an atelectasis on that side would actually result in a pneumonectomy. And then you would, if you had that scenario, you would have to have a better pulmonary function if you compare to having um, a tumor that would reside very close to a lower bronchus that would result in a smaller damage to the lung. We did not uh, allow either candidates for radiochemotherapy with a curative intent to be included in the trial. They should receive their standard treatment and neither patients with uh, brain metastases. So all patients were treated with seven grade times eight and they were prescribed to the 65 to 70% isodose line which would mean that they would have approximately 50% high dose in the middle of the target. Uh, concerning the organs at risk, we had a delineation prior to the treatment, which was performed at each center concerning the spinal cord, with both the contra and ipsilateral main bronchi, as well as the trachea. <clears throat> and as you can see at the picture here on your right hand side, we delineated the trachea <coughs> like this, as well as the uh, main bronchi like this. Uh, and this shape of the different bronchi was a result that we thought that if we would have an injury uh, on this part of the bronchial tree, that would actually result then in a total collapse of the lung or then a total collapse of, of both lungs. That would be uh, the reason for delineating them in this way. Uh, the esophagus and heart were, were also delineated prior to the treatment at each center, and there was also a dummy run performed uh, prior to starting the, uh, the trial. Prior to the analysis, uh, there was a central review, review delineation uh, performed by one radiation oncologist and checked by a thoracic uh, radiologist as well to ascertain that we had the same sort of uh, delineation for all the patients. We also delineated the lumen of these uh, bronchi. And then we created a structure called structure two, which was the lumen, which was expanded by two millimeters and then to create a structure just representing the bronchial wall, structure two minus structure one uh, created the bronchial wall. This was uh, performed prior to the statistical analysis to see if that would be a better way to predicting bronchial toxicity. Uh, we looked at dose, the D-backs, uh, the dose to 0 0.01 cc, 0 0.2 cc, 0.5 cc and 1.0 cc. And all these doses were transformed into EQD2. So the follow-up consisted of clinical visits every three months for the first two years, then every six months. 
uh, we looked at pre-specified toxic symptoms and the patients did regular CT scans as well and also PET CTs and regular pulmonary functions post-treatment. Uh, these are the organs at risk and dose constraints. Uh, the protocol was designed that we had a hierarchical way of, um, of looking at all the organs at risk as well as the dose coverage and the dose um, guidelines. So we had these first three, the spinal cord, the trachea and the main bronchus considered to be contralateral, had hard dose constraints. And the background was that we wanted to spare the contralateral bronchus uh, because we thought that if we would have any problems, the major problem would be atelectasis, and this was uh, based on prior work. <clears throat> As a secondary uh, uh, hierarchical endpoint, I would say that would be uh, coverage of the target, and uh, third, we would have a dose guidelines to the ipsilateral main bronchus, uh, the esophagus, and the heart as well. And we did not have any dose restrictions for the intermediate bronchus or the lower bronchi and neither the great vessels. So if we look at the results, <clears throat> here is uh, an overview of table one, which represents the patient characteristics. As you can see, we included 74 patients. Unfortunately, three patients did not receive the entire protocol treatment and six patients did not have centrally located tumors according to our definition, so we lost nine patients. Neither of these patients uh, had any great uh, four to five side effects. So altogether, we could evaluate 65 patients. You can see that uh, there was a, let's say, median age of 70 years, which was uh, anticipated. They were in good performance status. 54 or 83% were in performance status zero to one and they had a lung function of median 1.5 liters. As you see here, the majority were uh, non-small cell lung cancer, but we also had uh, a couple of renal cell carcinoma and a couple of colorectal, cell, colorectal cancers as well. If you look at the targets, we had 65 patients, but we had three patients treated for two centrally located targets. So we had 68 uh, highest targets. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that they were indeed extremely central. The distance to the proximal bronchial tree were in median zero millimeters, so they were actually abutting. And if you look at the distance to the main bronchus, it was also very close, uh, less than one centimeter for the entire cohort and for the group A patients, only five millimeters. And also the distance to the lower bronchus <clears throat> was only one millimeter. Uh, they were, in general, around two centimeters in size. And as you can see here, the cytological verification where 65% were cytologically verified and the rest were only radiologically verified. We did allow patients to be treated at the same time for uh, other non-centrally located lung lesions. So 21 targets of that kind uh, we had also. This is the local control, both for the entire group, as well as divided in group A and B. Uh, altogether, we had nine patients with local failures. Uh, the local control rate at uh, one year was 85%, and at two years, it was 83%. So it was a good rate of local control, and it did not differ between group A and group B, as you can see here. Uh, then it comes to the toxicity uh, profile of the treatment. And as you can see here, the most commonly recorded toxicity was actually uh, dyspnea, grade one and two, uh, fatigue, grade one and two, and cough, grade one and two. Uh, so that was, in that case, that was tolerable. Uh, it um, was also a lot of patients that had these types of symptoms pre-SPRT, but the symptoms presented here, they have been graded as related or possibly related to the SPRT treatment. Uh, these are the pre-specified toxic symptoms that is shown here in this one. Our major concern, though, was that we did have grade 5 side effects. We had eight cases of bronchopulmonary hemorrhages. We had one case of a fistula between the trachea and the esophagus. 
and we had one case of pneumonitis. Uh, the lung infection uh, case here that you see as well is, uh, is a patient that also had a bronchopulmonary hemorrhage. For the patient with a fistula, that patient had unintentionally received a too high dose to the esophagus. And the pneumonitis patient uh, was a patient that was admitted due to a pneumonitis to another hospital but did not receive the proper treatment. Uh, but according to the bronchopulmonary hemorrhages for these cases, uh, we had one that had a regional recurrence who received additional radiotherapy, but we did not have any one of these that were actually diagnosed with a local failure that could have contributed. If you look at these patients uh, a bit more in detail, uh, this is a picture of the localization of how the tumors have been uh, residing. As you see, the green uh, indicate um, local failure. The blue small stars are patients without local failures or grade 5 side effects, and the patients with grade 5 side effects are indicated with the red small stars. And as you can see here in this group A, you can see that you have uh, more grade 5 side effects as compared to group B. Here is an overview of the grade 5 bleeding. Uh, as well as uh, the overall, as well as the pneumonitis and the fistula as well. Uh, it's just a description of these patients um, because we only have 10 patients and it's difficult to compare with the patients that did not suffer these uh, type of side effects uh, that were 55 patients. Um, but if you look here, you can see that we had uh, four patients with squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, you can also see that they were indeed uh, centrally located. Uh, we only had one patient that were located in group B that had the bleeding. Uh, you can also see that in EQD2, in the DMAX to the trachea or main bronchus, they had received uh, high doses. In terms of anticoagulants or TKI treatment, I think this is very difficult to interpret since the uh, anticoagulant treatment was actually recorded at the inclusion of the trial and as you can see here in the last column the patients actually had the, their side effects after a median of about 15 months so very few pay we don't really know how if they were on anticoagulants when they actually bled for these patients and you can also see that this type of side effect that might uh, appear quite late it doesn't appear uh, within the first year all of them uh, at least Um, here you can see the dose plan pictures of these grade 5 bleeding cases. And as you can see, most of them are located uh, on the right hand side, and you can also see that they are located very close to the centrally, central airways as well. I just put in the slide as well just to show you about this presentation because this is a high rate of grade 5 toxicity, and you might ask yourself why this appeared. And as I showed you in the beginning, up until here, 2015-16, the term of ultracentral location was not really very well known. And um, so, so these are the grade five side, of, side bleeding, sorry, and the, the yellow uh, triangles are marked with the fistula as well as the pneumonitis. And uh, it was around in 2015 here that we actually thought that this might be too toxic. We had we had uh, regular discussions within the Nordic group about these high-grade side effects. But here in 2015, we also did a thorough review and looked at the side effects and when they presented. And then we had an early stop of inclusion in patient, for patients in group A. And then, as you can see, we had a lot of side effects coming after to 2015. So when we looked at the possibility or, or why we had this high grade toxicity, we could see that uh, this is a cumulative incidence of the time to grade five bleeding. This is for all the patients, and you can see that they came up to 22 months. This is a subdivision into group A as well as to group B, and this was a significant difference. And here, if we divide these patients between of the distance to the main bronchus or trachea, you can see that uh, there's an increase if you have a 
tumor residing within zero to five millimeters as compared to those being more than a centimeter away. Then you have to be aware that these are small patient groups. You only have 24 patients in this, um, this part and 15 patients here and 26 patients of more than 10 millimeters away. So we also did a univariate analysis uh, where we could see that this high grade toxicity, where we looked at grade five bleedings as well as grade five toxicity, it was related to distance to the main bronchus as well as to dose to the lumen of the main bronchus trachea. We also looked at the structure two and three uh, as well, but uh, this was actually the best predictor to look at the dose to the structure one or to the lumen. Um, there were other risk factors that we would have wanted to look at, of course, but endobronchial tumor growth that was prohibited according to the protocol, so we couldn't. The use of VGF inhibitors was also prohibited, so we couldn't look at that either. And as I commented on earlier, if you look at anticoagulants, I think that's very frail to look at that because we don't really know what the patients were on at the time of the bleeding as well as the TKI, because we did have a few patients with renal cell carcinoma who were on TKI, uh, like the 10th, for example, which might also have a VGF inhibitory effect. So we could not check for these risk factors, unfortunately. So on the physics side, uh, one of our physicists also did a modeling of grade five bleeding. Uh, here in uh, the the A picture, you can see the model uh, from all the dose uh, parameters tested, as you can see here. Uh, this is a model of the dose to 0.2 cc with the 95% confidence in interval. And this is correspondingly to the D max with a 95% confidence interval. Uh, we then looked at overall survival, and this is, of course, extremely difficult to compare anything with because we included patients with both metastatic disease as well as primary non-small cell lung cancer. What I think is important here is that you see that they have an inferior uh, overall survival. Uh, at two years, only 58% of the patients uh, were actually uh, alive. And uh, since we see that these side effects may appear late, we don't really know if the patients would have lived longer if we would have seen even more side effects. We don't really know. What we see here is that the patients in group A uh, were doing worse than patients in group B. So they were both having an increased rate of toxicity as well as having inferior survival. So the conclusion and the hypothesis generated from the HILAS trial was that tumors located correspondingly to group B could probably be treated with high tumor load control and a small risk of grade five bleeding given a maximum dose of 70 to 80 gray to the main bronchus trachea. And this is then in EQD2 with an alpha beta ratio of three. But to give any certain limit on what you actually could tolerate of these uh, high or these uh, uh, large bronchi could tolerate that was not, not possible to actually conclude from these this very limited material. So what we are doing right now in the Nordic group is that we have gathered more than 200 patients that have been treated both in the prospective HILAS trial but also outside with the same fractionation schedule uh, in the absence of other treatment options. And we are looking at uh, both clinical toxicity, which type, which grade, and which risk factors that we can find, and also a modeling of toxicity to try to establish the maximum tolerated dose to different parts of the proximal bronchial tree. Uh, we're also looking at the accumulated liver dose to the bronchi based on uh, CBCT scans, which is a cooperation with uh, orders in Stockholm. And, uh, we're also looking at uh, sub-analysis of only the curatively treated primary non-small cell lung cancer to see the pattern of failure and the progression-free survival in this patient group. So that's the ongoing work. So then I'd like to thank all of the participating centers, of course, in this uh, trial. And uh, thank you. Thank you.
Karen, for a great uh, presentation of the HILAS trial and uh, what you are running. Uh, there came some questions in the chat box, and I would like uh, to start with the first uh, one, which is a general one, came from Morton, about what's the risk of uh, fatal hemoptysis without treatment uh, in these patients? Yeah, I know, I know this is a question that we have been discussing quite a lot, I think, in our Nordic meetings. And um, um, I, I don't know if anyone knows. If you if you look at the literature in, in autopsy material, I've seen the number of about 10% that lung cancer patients die of fatal hemoptysis. Uh, sometimes when you look at uh, fatal hemoptysis due to conventionally fractionated radiotherapy, you have uh, high numbers as well, but I haven't seen these in, in these late trials with modern radiotherapy. I think this is, uh, this is extremely interesting, of course. Uh, we have discussed how we could actually try to address this question if you could do an epidemiological study to see uh, how common it would be that you would bleed anyway, because this is, of course, important when you should decide what the maximum tolerable dose is because uh, you have to put that in relation to what's the likelihood of bleeding if you if you don't do anything or if you treat these patients suboptimally. But yeah. I, I don't have any specific numbers. Yeah, in, in this uh, case, I would like to ask you, because there came a question from Jens Overgaard, uh, have you broken the data down according to histological subtypes? To which extent have you considered problem of uh, tumor hypoxia and squamous cell carcinoma when given radiotherapy uh, in high doses uh, per fraction? Uh, according to toxicity, we looked at um, uh, we looked at squamous cell carcinoma as a risk factor for bleeding because we didn't know that they have an increased risk, uh, but uh, we could not find any statistical significant difference. But of course, it's a limited patient material. It's only 65 patients. And hopefully when we have this bigger material, we could have a better answer to that. Uh, but... Uh, Tumor hypoxia, my friend. Hypoxia? No, we did not. Uh, I, I have to read it. <laughs> yes. may, I, may I ask a general question to all of you uh, hyper, hyper-fractionated guys doing this kind of treatment? Why do you not consider hypoxia when you know that when you increase the dose per fraction, the issue become worse and worse? And especially for the lung cancer, there is very strong data indicating the problem of a hypoxic scenario in the non-small cell lung cancer. Our problem was not the tumor control. Our problem was the toxicity, I think, because we can the toxicity because you give an enormously high dose because you need to do that to overcome hypoxia because you don't deal with it otherwise. Mm. We will look at that in the prospective trial, Jens. You will never look at that must... answer. You will just say answer that now. But my point is, you have to multitask. You have to take the biology into consideration. Don't forget it and think it disappear if you don't think about it. Yes. Uh, another question came from Gita about uh, what was no, uh, there was no requirement for motion management in the HILAS uh, trial. Uh, do you think that could have impacted our uh, results, Karin? Um, I think that what, what you really, I think that we have to know what the what the risk organ actually get what what the dose is to the the, the organs at risk and um, um, yeah I, I think that's um, do you, so you mean that because, yeah should I elaborate should I elaborate myself yeah, yes yes just that, elaborate her question <laughs> the thing is that 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 we are in the in the dosimetric data you are calculating what was the risk uh, that the risk uh, increased uh, with the, the high dose to a very small volume of the bronchi. And I, and I know uh, that we did a lot of work on delineation, delineating the bronchi. And it was very difficult. That's why we, after two turns, have to send it to you. And then you did a better uh, or a more um, strict delineation. And that, that's kind of good. But we know it all moves. And... Um, I'm just, uh, I think that we, maybe we don't know precisely where the dose ended up. That's just my point. So, so of course, but of course, this will just be, this is kind of, 
planned dose. It's it's not the actual uh, delivered dose, and um, I mean it's not possible to do it perfect. But um, yes, I just wanted us to have that in mind as well. Yeah, but I think that would be important when we look actually at the delivered dose, even if it's a, a smaller material. But then we will see if you would actually if it's a great difference between the planned dose. Yes. Thank you. We yes. just move on. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes, and um, the last speak today is from uh, Søren Müller, uh, who's a uh, consultant, a PhD from um, the Hospital, who actually knows a lot about brain tumors, but also a lot about uh, uh, brain metastasis. Did I say lung tumors before? I mean brain tumors. And, and you're standing on the shoulders of others before you that have uh, implemented and um, treated, uh, implemented SR, uh, SRS and um, treated a lot of patients. So I'm curious to hear what you can tell us about your ex experiences at this potato sun. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for the invitation. Um, just to start out, uh, which uh, screen are you seeing? Are you seeing my presentation screen? No. Mm, no, not now. I'm not seeing anything. How about now? Yes. Are you seeing my presentation? No, no. not really. Mm. But we know it works because it did before. We know it works, yes. Now it looks better. Yeah. What if I switch now? Um, yeah. Yes. You're seeing the presentation, right? And not Perfectly. the one with my notes. Okay. So thanks a lot. Now we go to um, to the brain. And um, as you know, the brain is a, is one of the is a is a major oligometastatic site. I in in my preparations, I I, I almost called it the uh, the first oligometastatic site, but that's uh, someone with a longer memory than I would probably correct me. Uh, and uh, and refer to surgery of the liver or, or, the, or the lung that goes uh, even further back. But it is uh, certainly in our daily uh, practice, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it takes a large part of our, um, of our time. So, uh, so the basic, the two basic uh, treatment modalities for, uh, for oligometastatic brain metastasis is uh, surgery uh, and, uh, and various um, variations on that theme or, uh, or radiotherapy. Um, so I'm just going to touch uh, briefly on surgery because there's no way of getting around it since half of all the brain metastases that are diagnosed, they are solitary. And a patient uh, that uh, is selected for surgery is usually a patient that has a large uh, um, um, uh, enhancing uh, lesion that has a mass effect on the brain, lots of edema. It's superficially located and it's uh, well um, away from the eloquent areas, uh, uh, speech and uh, motor cortex and, and all these things. And obviously the patient needs to be fit as well. And surgery is especially um, uh, useful if you need to have a diagnosis. Surgery, I'm also one of the reasons I'm going to touch on it as well is because of some of the most compelling uh, and strong evidence that we have uh, about survival for, for brain metastasis uh, treatment it comes from, from the surgeons, actually. And uh, this uh, study, you, you may have uh, uh, heard about this before, came out in 1990. So it was done in the 80s, a, a, a neurosurgeon named Patchell, who, um, who at that time, the... Um, uh, the standard treatment for brain metastasis for a single brain brain metastasis was uh, was whole brain radiotherapy, and obviously they uh, they had a technique to do uh, surgery uh, for the brain metastasis, but no evidence. So they did a trial where they randomized patients to receive either whole brain radiotherapy and just a biopsy, or whole brain radiotherapy uh, and um, a tumor resection. And look how nicely it came out with just 48 patients. This is how you do it, guys. Right. Um, the overall survival was uh, was 40 weeks uh, in favor of the patients uh, that had the surgery and only 15 weeks for the patients who, who had uh, whole brain radiotherapy alone. So this is some of the only uh, actual uh, uh, randomized uh, class one evidence that we have uh, uh, about um, uh, prolongation of survival in brain metastasis. As you know, there's lots of ways to, uh, to go about this. 
in Denmark, we use the uh, the LINAC and we've used uh, we've given this treatment. Uh, uh, and those that came before me have, have used this treatment uh, at Rishos since uh, 1996. I think the plans that we can uh, uh, that we can make are just as good as uh, the ones with these with the other treatments. Uh, and um, and also we don't have them available in Denmark, so I think we are happy with the LINAC. This is a uh, an example of a plan uh, of a VMAP plan. As you will see, the uh, the arcs they uh, are in different. Uh, um, in different planes, so it's a non-coplanar treatment with a, a high central dose and a, a steep uh, dose uh, fall-off. So we um, we've received the funding to do a, a project to do a, a project about uh, brain metastasis, and one major part of this project is is a retrospective database of the patients that we treated at Rishospital and, and Herlev. And uh, we had uh, initially planned to go all the way back uh, to, 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 uh, to 96, but, uh, but the database only goes back to 2008. And, uh, and then uh, the actually, actually the, the, the solid data that we could obtain uh, sort of begin around 2012. So this is what I've uh, focused on in the, uh, in the current uh, database. And this shows the, uh, um, um, the, the diagnosis of the, the patients that were treated. As you, I don't know if you can see it here, but uh, but it uh, this is from when there were about 1,100 patients in the uh, database. Now we have slightly less than 1,400 patients, uh, but this is not likely to have changed any. Uh, Non-small cell lung cancer obviously is, uh, is, uh, is accounts for more than half of the patients with brain metastasis that we treat. Breast cancer, melanoma, uh, colorectal uh, cancer, GI cancers. And renal cancer; those are the uh, those are the uh, are the large uh, uh, um, diagnoses. Most patients, as I said to begin with, uh, have a solitary metastasis. This is the fifty percent uh, line, and uh, as you can see, the um, we've treated patients with two, three, four, five, and actually also six uh, uh, metastases. Most patients, uh, as you know, uh, uh, stereotactic radio surgery (SRS) is uh, is a treatment that's um, that you can that you can repeat uh, as needed um, uh, for new lesions. But actually, a large majority of patients, 80 percent, uh, they uh, they receive only one course of uh, of, uh, of SRS. We've sent an uh, an abstract to Estro, uh, Gita, and I. Um, and uh, one of the one of the points we we, we make in this uh, this abstract is that uh, about two thirds of patients that that uh, undergo SRS actually at any time have a follow up scan, and of these patients, forty five percent of them have um, have recurrence. Um, so that the radiological relapse rate of about twenty nine percent, and that's pretty much in line with with the literature. And as you can see, patients have uh, local recurrence, remote recurrences or, or both. So now I've, I've been asked to say a little bit about the uh, about the definition of oligometastatic brain disease and as Skida said uh, nicely in the beginning there is no definition other than what's been included in the trials. So this has become the central uh, dogma one to four metastasis that's uh, that's oligometastatic uh, brain disease and this uh, uh, Stems from the um, <clears throat> from the from the phase three trials that were carried out in the 90s and the noughts, uh, where where patients basically had one to one to four uh, brain metastases, and uh, and I think that's that's been the evidence that's been carried on into the Danish uh, guidelines that we uh, that we still use. So that's the unfulfilling uh, answer to that. There was one of these trials that I'd just like to, uh, to, to, to show some highlights from because it illustrates uh, some of the difficulties with, the, with this research area. It's a, it's a, it was a Japanese trial where they randomized 132 patients with all sorts of uh, uh, primary diagnoses with uh, brain metastases. And, uh, and they asked the question, uh, uh, what, difference, what effect does whole brain radiotherapy following SRS have on various parameters? And of course, on distant uh, uh, recurrences, uh, I don't think anyone would be surprised to see that uh, that uh, whole brain radiotherapy reduces the rate of uh, distant uh, recurrences in the brain. So no surprise there. 
it's a little more surprising actually that the rate of local control actually improves markedly as well when you give whole brain radiotherapy on top of, uh, of the stereotactic uh, radio surgery. But, uh, but what's also very illustrative is that even though whole brain um, actually has a lot of advantages in controlling the intracranial disease, this does not translate into overall survival. And this is, uh, as I said, this is typical for this, uh, for this field. And uh, obviously the answer is that, uh, is that uh, most patients uh, die from, uh, from extracranial uh, progression. So of course this central dogma as I've called it is, is obviously been, uh, been challenged as it uh, should, but just not in very um, uh, convincing ways. Uh, one of the studies that's often um, uh, quoted is from uh, uh, a colleague named Yamamoto from Japan and they have uh, conducted a massive retrospective study of 2,500 patients that received uh, uh, SRS uh, using a gamma knife at their clinic. And they uh, they found 548 patients that had uh, um, um, that had received um, uh, SRS for more than five brain metastases. And so they what they did was they matched these uh, 548 patients with many metastases with uh, 548 uh, patients that had similar prognostic factors. And what they what they sh have been quoted as showing is that the overall survival was, was only slightly worse for the, for the patients that had a lot of metastases and the, the, the neurological outcomes uh, um, uh, were actually uh, uh, equal. So, so, so there wasn't a um, uh, sort of a, a bad brain deterioration due to a, uh, a withholding a, a whole brain a radiotherapy. And this has been, uh, this has been interpreted as a, um, as, as a, an argument for, for giving SRS, that is local treatment to many brain metastases. But I think the, the answer, the, 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 the criticism is, is that obviously these patients have been heavily selected. Um, and, and I think this, um, uh, this would reflect our own practice. I think that whenever we have a very fit patient that's, uh, that's doing well and that has well-controlled extracranial disease or no extracranial disease, we, we, we tend to, uh, to want to go the extra mile and we tend to, to, um, to, to treat them uh, perhaps in a special way. And that's, uh, and that's probably what, what they have, what's, what's, that's, uh, what's been, we're, what we're seeing here. Um, I'll just go back. Um, so, so it's been, um, it's, it's been examined uh, what, what the actual uh, prognostic factor with, uh, with brain metastasis is. Is it, is it the actual number or, or is it, as some have proposed, is it the volume of the, um, of the brain uh, metastases? And, uh, and, and for some guidelines, actually, um, the, the, the US neurosurgical guidelines, they have uh, come to the conclusion that the, the volume is actually more important than the actual number. Um, uh, so, so if patients have a volume of uh, of less than seven uh, uh, cubic centimeters, uh, then uh, then they recommend uh, local treatment SRS. Um, um, uh, yeah, because the the prognosis is, should uh, should should be better. But but this is uh, this is contradicts a lot of uh, well known uh, literature and very large. Um, um, uh, retrospective uh, series, uh, the GPA as, uh, as is one of the older ones. Uh, um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a development of the recursive partitioning analysis uh, where, where, where the uh, diseases have been divided, where, where the patients have been divided into diagnoses as they should. And, and in all these, uh, in many of these uh, diagnoses, uh, the, the number of brain metastases is a, is a pretty strong uh, prognostic factor. So I think, uh, I, I think the number of metastases does, uh, does make a, a difference. Okay, so there are some special situations. I was also asked to, to uh, talk about our experience and how we do things at uh, Rishuspital and Herlev. And uh, one of the special situations that we have, um, um, as you guys have as well, is, is recurrent uh, brain metastases. And it's, it, you have to be really careful before you uh, deem a metastasis to be, uh, that has received SRS to be recurrent because, uh, because brain necrosis uh, basically mimics um, recurrent uh, tumor uh, very closely. So you, you really have to, um, to have a, um, 
a, a skilled and experienced uh, multidisciplinary team looking at them and you need to have um, uh, sequential scans. You, you can't from one scan uh, uh, make the diagnosis. Most often you can't, uh, you can't uh, diagnose a recurrence uh, from, from just one scan. You need to do several scans and this is also reflected in our practice. But uh, another uh, so, so what we do, and this is also part of the, uh, the project that I told you about uh, earlier, we have a clinical trial uh, where we um, uh, where we enroll the patients that we give uh, um, uh, that we uh, uh, give um, retreatment. So we retreat them with uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, the same dose, uh, 18 gray. Um, um, but we but we follow them more closely. We do um, we do some special imaging uh, in order to hopefully uh, find the, the patients and be able to stratify the ones that uh, that uh, profited from uh, treatment from the ones that didn't. And we've actually asked a, a very simple question uh, as a consequence of the fact that uh, that it's 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 almost impossible to to distinguish recurrence from uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, necrosis and treatment related changes. So the central question in in this uh, study is 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 does the lesion grow following uh, following treatment? Because if you have a, a, a necrosis that that grows uh, and it's in an eloquent area, the patient can be just as symptomatic as uh, as if it's a, a tumor recurrence. So so that's uh, I, I, we felt that that was really the uh, the important question to know is do we do we actually ever gain control of a tumor that's uh, that uh, that grows uh, if you if you retreat them. So that's one thing that we are doing now, um, and. Um, Another thing that we practice is, uh, and this is just this is standard treatment. It's the large tumors we we like to fractionate. Uh, there was an old RTOG study that showed that the larger the tumor, the larger the risk of uh, radionecrosis, and also phase two studies that showed that this fractionation scheme of nine gray times three is uh, is well tolerated and uh, and is. Uh, if is, is moderately uh, efficacious for larger uh, tumors. So this is a routine uh, practice. Eloquent, eloquently located uh, tumors that is in the brainstem or near the chiasm, we use a lower dose. Postoperatively, we routinely uh, give uh, SRS. Uh, this is uh, the guidelines, the national guidelines state that we should consider it in all cases. And, uh, and in most cases, we offer the treatment because as you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's well tolerated and uh, quick and uh, easy and uh, low, low toxicity. And actually, the uh, I should say the um, the um, the rationale for giving postoperative SRS is uh, some is, is two recent uh, randomized trials where patients were either given or not, uh, or given uh, SRS or whole brain, and uh, SRS was uh, about just about um, uh, half uh, uh, cut in half the risk of uh, of a local recurrence following uh, tumor surgery for uh, a single brain metastasis. Small cell lung cancer, we don't use SRS. We use it um, for patients that uh, have, um, have long survival times and have already received whole brain uh, radiotherapy. They are, they are a special uh, uh, therapeutic uh, dilemma and we, we, we will sometimes treat them with the SRS. And of course, you know, the, there are some uh, systemic uh, treatments where, where we uh, consider um, um, oh, that should be an EGFR where we uh, consider a primary uh, a chemotherapy or immunotherapy or BRAF inhibition or whatever um, uh, before uh, before radio surgery. So these were just some uh, some special situations, and I'm sure you are familiar with them if you uh, treat brain metastases in your uh, practice. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much. It was very clear and precise. Uh, we have some questions in the um, in the chat box, and uh, the first one is from Meta Hansen um, about one of the trials you have been uh, presenting. Why do you think that the local control is improved after whole bo uh, brain irradiation? Is it because it's an uh, anatomical miss with the SRS, or any other reason? That's the first question. Oh, it's a really good question, and I think it, it could could probably be both. Um, I think we have a tendency to to use the same uh, the same dose even for larger tumors, and perhaps uh, 
perhaps we should be using larger doses for larger tumors, um, uh, as is sometimes practiced with the, in, in gamma knife uh, centers. Um, but I, I, really, I really don't know, actually. Um, it, it could be both, obviously. Okay, the second question comes also from Sandy. It's general about uh, SRS. Uh, what is, um, do you consider giving different doses to different pathological subtypes, like colorectal, uh, different to than uh, renal cell carcinoma, different from, is there any data about that? Um, um, there is, I, I don't think that, it, I think there are data that, uh, that show different, um, uh, different radio sensitivity to the uh, to the tumors and different recurrence rates and definitely melanoma is one of the the tumors that uh, that we have difficulty controlling with uh, with SRS but 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 um but that being said I don't uh, I don't know of any trials that show uh, that have that have shown this in in practice but 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 there definitely is an, an issue there mm. Because I think uh, considering also the idea of that the different tumor subtypes have a different resistance, uh, whether it's hypoxic or different, may maybe they differently respond to radiotherapy. And we know that from the brain tumors in general, uh, you need to give more to glioblastoma, I think. I, I'm not <laughs> treating brain cancer, but I think uh, you need that. <laughs> yes. Uh, um... Definitely, but but we, we 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 it's a it's a it's a narrow uh, um, window of uh, it's a narrow therapeutic window because we as you know we can't just uh, double the dose we will have uh, we'll have too much necrosis so yeah. it's uh, it's really difficult and and on top of that uh, as I said uh, um, distinguishing recurrence from necrosis is uh, is really difficult and that yeah okay. Thank you very much for your uh, answers. I don't think I can find any more questions. Are, are there any, anyone who have questions that they didn't write on the chat box? They are willing to, so just go ahead and ask it. No. So Gita, maybe you, we close the session. Yes. You Yes, I yeah. wanted to uh, close the session because we're also a little uh, behind now. So, um, but that's fine. That's fine. I just want to uh, invite you all uh, to join the discussion because we want to um, to start a national uh, 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 Olga metastatic or national registry, um, uh, or it's it's going to be a phase two trial. Uh, but uh, with participation of all DMCGs, so that's all uh, cancer groups, all solid cancers, uh, just um, just because it, it's it's not it's not possible to do, or in my view and in many others uh, view, <laughs> possible to do uh, phase three trials as it is now because the definition of the disease or the patient groups uh, is not uh, it's not good enough to 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 really have uh, uh, precise um, research questions for the majority of, of uh, diagnostic subgroups okay that was a long sentence but uh, in uh, the DCC radiotherapy IP15 group um, led by SNI we are inviting uh, representatives from all uh, DMCGs and all uh, in oncology departments in Denmark um, and also uh, representatives from uh, groups that do translational research to help us uh, design a, a solid uh, study so we can get more knowledge uh, on how to uh, treat this very heterogeneous uh, group of patients. Um, so. I've been writing out, or we have been writing out to to, uh, to all departments and all DMCGs, or are in the process. So when you hear from us, just just please do not uh, just delete the mail, but um, please answer us. I just wrote, Jan. I don't know if you saw that from the hangar, yeah, <laughs> uh, because we need representatives from from all the DMCGs, and and then I think we're gonna we're just gonna make another uh, web meeting to. Uh, uh, and write up, we already have a kind of a suggestion, but then we'll have all your input so we can do it in the right way. So that was kind of what I wanted to say. What about Jimmy? Asa, do you have anything to uh, 
Oh, thank you. And consider thank sending you. if you are not able to treat uh, with uh, SRS or SBRT, please consider it for your patient wherever you are in Denmark. There is some centers near you that can treat oligometastatic disease. And we will do a lot of translational research in the future, but we would like uh, your participation as well. I can see some of the people, for oncologists from different medical oncology departments who are, don't have uh, radiotherapy uh, machines. Please do consider this for your patient. And you will even try to take hypoxia serious. Yes, we, we need to take hypoxia serious. Okay. Uh, to and decrease the dose. The next uh, trial to de-escalate the dose because we will control hypoxia. I have, I I have recorded you, Asa. <laughs> yes, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, have a nice evening and Merry Christmas to everyone. Thanks. Bye.